we want to welcome you again this evening to our Discovering the Heart of God series. Um, we're going to treat you with a few songs tonight. And I have to tell you one. My brother's going to owe me one. He's out walking somewhere and he's lost. <laughs> So whenever I see him, and my, bro my brother Rudy's out there looking for him, driving. So when I see them come through the door, we'll pause and do some music. You know, we want to welcome you. Are there any here tonight that were not here last night or this morning? Can I see your hand? We do have a few. Welcome. I just want to just give you a little bit of a, of a preview, review of what we're doing. This is... The second night of a nine-night series. And this last night, we, we looked, we had a concert, but part of the, part of the presentation of last night is how prophecy is being fulfilled about the gospel going into the whole world. And we talked, we shared some of the incredible things that are happening in the most difficult area of the world to evangelize. And that's an area known as a 1040 window. There's a lot, most, most religions there are, are Muslim, um, Hindus, Buddhists, and, um, but yet there's a lot of people in that area of the world that are seeking for something better. Um, bring your family, bring your friends to these meetings. This, the purpose of our meetings together is just to try to set aside any misconceptions that we have about a, an increase in, perfect picture of God. We want, to, we want to grasp a true picture of the heart of God. And the messages in his word, that's what we're going to focus on. This morning we focused a little bit on the character of God and discovered that God has been given a really a bad rap. Most Christians Non-Christians have a total misunderstanding of his character of love. And as we shared this morning, you know, take, for example, insurance companies. Here's how they see God. Acts of God are hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and, and, and all the wickedness that happens in this world. Acts of God. Well, the Bible makes it very clear that God is a God of love. And because there were so many screwed up misunderstandings of God even back 6,000 years ago, the children of Israel during that time, what did he do? He sent his son Jesus. And when Jesus walked on this earth and healed the sick and brought sight to the blind, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. That's all we need. And you know those words of Jesus. Jesus turned and says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we, we, we focused on, his, on God's character of love. And... Um, this evening, our topic is going to be to look very carefully at, well, the topic is entitled, Can We Trust a Two-Edged Sword? Uh, I'm going to just have to make a confession to you. I tend to get a little bit, you know, I, I have my, my outline and my slides and so forth, but I discovered this morning that I have way too much information to share. Tonight's, tonight's session, I'm actually going to divide into two because it has to be covered in its entirety, and I don't want to spend two hours here. But so we're going to just bump the, uh, the schedule a little bit. To, so the topic tonight, can we trust the two-edged sword, is part one. Sunday night is can we trust the two-edged sword, part two. And then Monday night, we're going to look at signs you can't ignore. Now, those really tie in together because tomorrow night we're going to be... Uh, Tomorrow night we're going to be looking at, I think it's the most incredible prophecy. If I had one, if I had one chance to preach a sermon or to, to share a Bible study with a person who is seeking, I'd turn you down to Daniel 2. It's one of the most amazing prophecies that authenticate the accuracy of Scripture. So that's just a little bit for us to think about. Um, again, I'd like to refer you to these great resources that... Uh, are available online, the Discover Bible School Through the Voice of Prophecy, Amazing Facts, Bible slash Lessons.org, a lot of good stuff. Now, this morning we talked about 
I encourage you if, you, if you want to begin a devotional experience, seeking God, dwelling with God, begin in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels. And one of the most wonderful devotional experiences that my wife and I have had over the years, we've taken the Bible and the book Desire of Ages, and there's a reference as to which chapters from the Bible this, these chapters are based on. And you read the scriptural verse and then read Desire of Ages. We have a supply of Desire of Ages here tonight. One per family. It's going to be at the back table. I don't want you to start tomorrow night. I want you to start tomorrow morning. So if it's one of those uh, books you need in your library, compliments of the Sierra Vista Church. So I wanted to just share that. Before we, can, we go on, I would like you to just bow your heads with me as, as we pray. Father, what a beautiful day it was out there today. We just look around us and we see your handiwork and your touch in your creation. We just say thank you. We also know that you have, one of the greatest creations is the creation of mankind, men and women and boys and girls. And we've met some beautiful creations here in this, in this church and in this community. Thank you for that. Lord, we're going to be opening your word again tonight. Just give us wisdom. Give us discernment. Give us understanding that will draw us closer to you is our prayer in your name. Amen. Would you agree with me that our eternal destiny is determined by our perception of God? You know, we need to truly know his heart. And if we must know his heart, we must find the most credible source to understand his heart. Now, in, in my study, I've come up to the conclusion that there are four sources on which we can base our belief. Source number one, self, self-proclaimed prophets and teachers. These are a dime a dozen out there. And occasionally, yeah, they guess something right. But I'm not sure that's where I want to stake my, my future. I'm not willing to accept what anyone says that will determine my eternal destiny unless they are 100% right 100% of the time. Is that unfair? I hope not. God foresaw that we would need to be warned about such deceptions. And in his word, he made it very plain. He said to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Book of Isaiah, eighth chapter. There's option two. We can look at human-derived science. There's fake science, and there's real science, and everything in between. So we can look at these human-derived theories, these scientific theories, but I'd like to suggest that they also are a little bit scary. They're theories and speculations that keep changing. Yeah, occasionally you get things right. I'll admit that. As an example... The theory, quotes unquotes, of evolution. Now, I am not, by any stretch of anybody's imagination, a genius. But I will never be convinced that a human being, as complicated and complex as we are, is a result of nothing, of random explosion in space. Not, not to even to mention the millions of other amazing 
evidences on this planet. Call them creations. The things of nature. You cannot get life from non-life. That's my simple little scientific theory. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but chaos never results in a state of perfect order. You cannot go from chaos to perfection. One of the, one of the laws of thermodynamics says everything is in the, in the process of, of becoming chaotic. For an example, I've got a little lawn in my, at my house. Well, according to evolutionists, if I just leave that lawn alone, it's going to take care of itself. It's going to mow itself. It's going to, after millions of years, it's... My wife and I have our little bench that we have to sit on to pull weeds. That doesn't work. Things are going from order to disorder. And they always have. I like the illustration that my friend Doug Batchelor from Amazing Facts came from a very, very wealthy family. Uh, Doug Batchelor gets his name from Douglas Aircraft. His father was one of the only businessmen that owned two private commercial airlines in the country. One of them was a huge company that he worked for for the government. He was named Douglas. And he's a, he's a pilot, he knows a lot about planes. One of his lectures, he said, you know, it's, it's like this. If you took and dropped a bomb in a pick and pull salvage yard, and you dropped that bomb and the pieces and, every, all, and they went just everywhere. And amazingly though, when they came down, they came down perfectly forming a Boeing 737. You say, well, that's, <laughs> that would never happen in a hundred billion years. You're exactly right. But that's kind of the percentages that the odds of a human body being formed out of nothing. In fact, the odds are even greater than that. It's just not going to happen. My wife and I, a few years ago, we were visiting some family in, in Seattle, and we went through the Boeing plant there in, in Everett. And if you've ever been there, whew, I mean, that assembly line, the miles and miles of, of wiring and electronics and you name it. If you would even suggest to one of those engineers that that, was, that, that whole jet happened by accident, they'd admit you to the local mental asylum. It would not happen. Then it comes to the assembly. Amazing, amazing technology. Well, <clears throat> those forged metal structures, the fuselage, those wings, did they just happen by accident? I'm going to ask my friend in the back there, we need to reduce the font size one click, if you wouldn't mind. I really appreciate Bob and Doug back there and, and their sidekicks. The next time you fly, if you have a chance, just take a look into the cockpit of a, a 737, wherever plane it is, and you see hundreds of these switches and electrical components and all these systems that make it such a safe way to, to travel. Just didn't happen. Ultimately, it would take an infinitely intelligent master designer an engineer to create such an amazing thing as a as an airplane. Well, you know where I'm going with this. I've had to, I've tried to have conversations with evolutionists, and we tend getting we tend up getting stuck at one place, and that is they have no room in their concept of how things happen. They have no room for an intelligent designer. So that's where we get stuck. And again, I'm a very simple-minded person. 
And um, I admire people who have great intellect, can put things on paper, and, and this kind of stuff just dazzles my mind. I read a book a few years ago, and I pulled it off my book, bookshelf just this last week as I knew I was going to be here this, this, this week. It was written by an author who was an agnostic. He was a very successful attorney, and he decided to, he was going to investigate the life of Jesus and the Bible and Christianity. He, was investig he would investigate it as he would in a courtroom. Show me the evidence. Look at the evidence. No, no emotional, no tug at your heart, heartstring stuff. And in his book entitled Jesus on Trial, author David Limburg, Limbaugh, actually he was Rush Limbaugh's brother, believe it or not, when writing about creation versus evolution, and, and I looked at that book again this afternoon, and whew, there's so much documentation and bibliography and, and illustrations. Unbelievable. But, but in that book, he quotes an amazing mathematical formula. When I was in high school and elementary school, I loved math. I mean, I just, I just loved numbers. When my granddaughters were playing games that require somebody to keep score, you know, I'm adding it up and they're going, Papa, how did you do that? I don't know, I just have this, this thing in my brain that is a calculator. But David Lumba quotes this amazing, amazing mathematical formula. And um, Dominique, is it? Is that her name? No. What is, tell me your name again. Gabriella. I'm sorry. Does that ever, did that start happening to you folk once you start getting that AARP stuff in the mail? I mean, as soon as this, I mean, it, it was gone. <laughs> Gabriella, I want you to listen to this one. I talked to her at lunch today. Now, most of the book that David Limbo wrote is way beyond my pay grade, and I have to really chew it long and hard to understand it. But I gleaned a few goodies that I want to share with you. Now, this formula that David Limbaugh shares is called applied mathematics. This mathematician is highly respected, highly decorated. His name was David Foster. And he did a research his research focused on this one probability, the probability of a very simple DNA of one of the most primitive cells that, that is known to mankind. What would be the possibilities of those components coming together in a random process, meaning they just came together, however, nothing organized. The DNA of a T4 bacteria that has, probab has the probability of developing into that little cell, that DNA, is 10 to the 78,000th power. Now, for you mathematicians, that's a 10 with 78,000 zeros after it. I mean, my mind can't even get around that. But then this is an interesting statistic that he shares. And he says that in a universe, and if you give the evolutionists the benefit of the doubt, they say the, you know, that our universe is 67 or whatever billion years old. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Our universe is only 10 to the 43rd power of zeros. Billions and quadrillions of times less, less time so even if those components of that simple cell were to go, and now you got to remember what he talked about in one of the laws of thermodynamics, things goes from order to disorder. Any mutation known to mankind, 999 out of 1,000 are always negative. Maybe one of them is neutral. And you're trying to tell me now that all these, the, the DNA, I mean the structure of our DNA, that they all chose right? 
But this statistic alone, this means that if, if that random process was taking place once every second, giving the evolutionists a benefit of the doubt, there's not nearly enough time. It could never happen. So when I was teaching, I started off my career as a fifth and sixth grade teacher. Gabby already knows that. And um, so I tried, to, I tried to give an illustration of what the odds would be of you know, the body randomly selecting all the right genes and so forth. And I came up with a very simple explanation, and you'll like this. Do you know what a C-5A transport military plane looks like? It's the biggest military plane that, the, that our military has. It's monstrous. I mean, they drive in army tanks. Is it the biggest? Maybe it's a bigger one now. Anyway, they drive in army tanks and, you know. If you were to take a million C-5A transport military planes, and each one of those planes, you'd load it up with the biggest box train car, train uh, uh, car you could find, you know, the ones that carry the coal or wheat. You loaded them all up with pennies. You got a million planes with a million pennies in them, and you take them up and you fly them up over Sierra Vista, and you tell them all at once to drop all those pennies at the same time. What would be the odds of all those pennies coming up heads? You say, that's a stupid question. It would never happen. So then how can you accept the fact that people who believe in evolution come up with theory that is even more ridiculous than that? Now, again, I'm a simple, make it plain kind of a guy. So we're going to look at tonight not only the reality of God creating us. By the way, you know, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the scientists now, because they've come to realize that the complexity of the DNA alone is just absolutely impossible for it to just happen randomly. So you know what they say now? Oh, mankind is a result of an alien invasion. Well, they're kind of right, aren't they? Came in the form of a baby. Anyway, I see that I get the thumbs up that the rest of the family is here. This is actually really a good time for us to kind of shift gears because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears into another area of why we can take God's word for what it is. So if Rudy and Lonnie and Jeannie are back there, we can invite you forward. All right. I'll keep talking then. One more minute. Is that prophetic time or real time? <laughs> so using that formula that I just gave you, that mathematical formula, that still does not give nearly enough time for the complexities of DNA itself and the origin of life to have happened. Those odds are just beyond my simple brain's calculation. The age of the earth. That's always a great discussion among believers and non-believers. And again, there's countless theories of the age of the earth. Dinosaurs, you know, they appeared, what, 50 million years ago or whatever. But when evidence surfaces that counters the scientific community, interesting things happen. I don't know if any of you heard of the archaeologist. Her name is Mary Schwitzer. She's an archaeologist from North, North, North Carolina State University. She was on an archaeological dig, and they discovered dinosaur bones that had soft tissue in the marrow. How many of you heard about this? Some of you have. Well, that has put the scientific community on their head because they've been saying soft tissue can't last, can't exist for more than 10,000 years. And so now we've got soft tissue and it's in, a, in an animal that's supposed to be millions of years old. Interestingly, Mary Schweitzer was, she published that in one of the scientific journals and was ceremoniously fired from her position 
I think she's got that position back. Or what about um, one of the professors at George Mason University, they were discussing some of the age of the earth and evolutionary stuff, and she said this, now for people who believe in a master designer, an intelligent designer, this is what they would say. So she's covering, she's given an explanation. Just because the fact that she even used the term intelligent design gave, gave room to believe that maybe she had a little bit of a belief system in her DNA, in her DNA that she believed in intelligent design. She was fired. Friends, I, I, I don't want to get political, but I'm going to tell you what. Right now, we here in America, we are this close to becoming a non-Christian nation because the atheists, the agnostics, the, the age of the earth, billions of years age of the earth, they control all of our educational systems. They control our schools. And I'm going to just encourage you. It's going to take God, take God to plant a little seed in your mind to say, you know what, I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to, I'm going to study his word and I'm not going to buy into this stuff because it's absolute garbage. And the thing that really disturbs me is what it's doing to our kids. I won't get sidetracked, but parents, if your kids are on TikTok or any of these other websites, there's so much demonic presence taking place. Every time you turn the television on, you go on your little phone. Your the enemy would appear at this stage of the game to be gaining ground. The third option of considering what truth is would be philosophies or traditions of men to discover what the heart of God is. Well, I'll pass on that option as well. And I'm going to trust them as an, an and their opinions either. We read this in Colossians, book that Paul wrote to the church there. He says, beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. I think that philosophy probably belongs to NBC and CNN and ABC and any other because you certainly get empty deceit through philosophies that have nothing to do with, with eternity. Amen? Amen? According to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And there it is. That's the number one source that I'd like to consider. And that's a source from God. We can look to the things of God. This includes nature. This includes the Holy Spirit. This includes the Bible. And I've concluded that of all of these four options, this one alone is the one that I can trust to reveal the true picture of the heart of God. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. A number of months ago, I was invited to preach up at a little church way up in Chinle, up there in Navajo Nation country. I got a late start, and I don't know the name of the little peak there, but it was about 6,000 foot elevation. It was about 11 o'clock at night. There was, there was no moon out, and I stopped. And it was probably one of the most spiritual experiences that I've had in the heavens declaring the glory of God. Millions and millions of stars like I'd never seen, the Milky Way and its brilliance and color. And I just sat there and said, Lord, thank you. It just didn't happen with one big bang, I'm sorry. The heavens declare the glory of God. Look to the sky, look to the moon, look to the heavens. These are part of his handiwork. 
gaze upon those beautiful, majestic mountains. I wish I could hike like I used to, because I'd love to hike, hike up Miller Mountain with Jim. He said he'd take me up there. Stand on the shores along of a beach and gaze out into the ocean. These are ways that God is declaring his heart to you and to me. And it's impossible, at least for me, not to see the hand of God in creation. It would be hard not to believe that it took an intelligent designer to design and create all of this. I think it takes more faith to be an atheist and agnostic than it does to be a Christian. And I will just tell you this, call me old school, but I still believe in a biblical worldview. I believe in the, the literal days of creation, that this world is no more than six or 7,000 years old, and that the scientists, eventually they're going to figure it out. But it may be too late. Only the Holy Spirit, this trustworthy source that helps our heart discover God. God promised that, that he would send the Spirit. It is only by this Spirit that we can comprehend spiritual things. The Bible says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit for God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You get that? You're here tonight. We're sharing spiritual truths from God's word. The only way you can really make sense of it is you say, Lord, I'm going to allow you to fill my brain with your spirit so I get understanding, so I can discern this. It's the Holy Spirit that makes it possible for us to discover the heart of God and the Bible and nature. The Bible is the only trustworthy source, and it's been around for thousands of years. In the book of Psalms, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. I love that verse. See, the word of God is timeless, and it's a relevant source for practical instruction, and it's the key to find salvation. Now, I know where I will look and trust for my answers. Nature, the Holy Spirit, God's Word. And I realize that there might be some here tonight who've never dug very deep into the Word of God. And as a result, you don't realize the significance of getting our answers from it and why we can trust that word. So tonight we're gonna give you a few other bits of building blocks. You can build a foundation which to build your faith. The Bible, it's by no stretch of the imagination, the greatest of all books. It's published in more languages. It's been published as more, more Bibles around this world than any other bestseller by thousands of times. No book has ever been so loved. No book has never been so hated. Never a book has been so revered. Never a book has been so despised. Millions have died for sharing it. Others have killed because of it. The Bible hides nothing. It gives full disclosure and it's been an inspiration of the most heroic acts in, in, in scripture, but it also records some of the most heinous crimes of humanity. Kings and paupers, young, old, they've all looked to its pages for guidelines, for instruction over the years. All scripture, Second Timothy, letter from Paul, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. <clears throat> now this next verse describes the power of God's word. This is we get our title for this evening's message. For the word of God is living and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So in our, in our search for truth and happiness, God, our creator, our loving father has not left us to flounder. He's left us his word. The Bible came about when the Holy Spirit gave inspiration to the minds of his servants. He gave dreams, visions, symbols, and figures. But these messages that he gave were, these prophets, writers, were not just robots that just holding a pen and, and the Lord guided the pen. No, they put their, the thoughts into their own words, into their own vernacular. They expressed these thoughts even though they had to put it in their own human language, which they did. And God inspired these messengers. They're of different rank, different education, different occupations. So you get that different flavor throughout the, throughout the Bible. Some were common fishermen. Others were kings, shepherds. One was a doctor. Some were farmers and preachers. Men from all walks of life, these 66 individual books that were brought together to form the Bible. Written over a period of 1,500 years. Written by more than 40 different men, most of whom have never met each other, but yet there's a thread, a golden thread that weaves it all through, this miraculous consistency between the books. Each writer, unique, mental, physical, spiritual gifts. And their, their writings have a wide, wide variety of style and diversity of subjects. Now to the careless or prejudiced reader, there may appear to be some discrepancies or contradictions in the Bible. For precept must be upon precept, upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Using this message as we, method as we study the Bible, we will discern a harmony of the most amazing book if we study using this recommended formula, this method. And if we're praying earnestly, searching, truth will become very clear. That's why but the enemy of souls wants to bring confusion. And so unfortunately, there are many churches here in North America, we have literally hundreds and hundreds of different denominations who basically their uniqueness is based on one or two verses of scripture. They don't tie the whole theme together. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a church down, in, down the south, the Snake Handlers Church. That's what they do for worship. You know, because there's that scripture about, you know, serpent not biting. Worldwide, there are more than 40,000 Christian denominations. So the enemy being the author of confusion, any little way he can bring about confusion, that's going to happen. I just want to share with you now for a few minutes to get to truth we must take every scripture that we find on a certain subject and make sure they fit together. We gotta to see the pieces of the puzzle as they fit together to see this complete picture. Now that's one of the reasons why I, this church here, through these series of lectures, they're gonna offer, if you come to nine out of the 10 meetings, a Strong's Concordance. Now, if some of you don't know what a Strong's Concordance is, it's a wonderful tool to pull all the scripture, I mean, to have to search through all the 66 books of the Strong's Concordance. Let's say you take, say you want to you study on what the Bible says about uh, music or about singing. You look up sing or music and it gives you all the passages. Maybe you want to look up some, it's a great tool to study the Bible. And as these pieces of the puzzle fit together, truth becomes very, very evident. You don't just take four or five pieces of the puzzle and, and craft a, a 
you want to call it a uh, tenet of faith. It has to be woven entirely through the scriptures. Now, we're going to dig now for some hidden treasure. Because up until the year 1947, I know that there's some folk in this room tonight that's in your lifetime. The earliest manuscripts that we had of the scriptures were copies. These were all written around 900 AD, 900 years after Christ. But then in 1947, a young shepherd boy was out tending his sheep, and he discovered in an area of the Holy Land, area of, of Qumran, a cave that contained leather containers with literally hundreds and hundreds of scrolls. And these had been preserved for centuries in these clay pots. We call them the Dead Sea Scrolls. More exploring led to the discovery of many, many such similar caves with hundreds and hundreds of more skulls discovered. Bible critics of a century ago believed that they had good reason to doubt some of the historical records of the Old Testament. But now many of these criticisms, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, their criticisms have been silenced because the shovel of the archaeologist unearthed truth that had never been known before. Until the 19th century, very little was known about the ancient past. The Bible was the only source for much of the information. And there were many doubters and skeptics that looked at that at the, from that vantage point. It was through ancient history. It was as though it was locked behind some of these secret, strange Egyptian picture writings. Nobody could read them. Nobody could understand them. They thought they could interpret them. No one in the world knew how to decode them. The Bible critics of a century ago found many, many reasons to raise doubt about the Bible. But friends, the good news is many of those criticisms have been silenced by the shovel of the archaeologist. Until the 19th century, little, know, little was known about the ancient past except what the Bible had to say about it. Ancient history seemed to be locked into this misunderstanding. No one in Egypt, the whole world, could decipher these ancient hieroglyphics and these, and these picture writings. But then, in 1798, Napoleon, he led a military expedition into Egypt. He had 38,000 soldiers with him. Took 100 artists and language experts, and they were trying to decipher so many of the ancient language of the past that nobody could read to help them better understand this culture, this intriguing land that they were in. Everywhere they saw these relics of the past, these unreadable inscriptions, these decorated monuments and temple walls. Napoleon and his scholars wondered what ancient messages those pictures writings contained. Now, little did they know the secrets of the hieroglyphics were about to be unsealed. For you see, one of Napoleon's soldiers unearthed one of the most incredible archaeological discoveries, became known, we call it today, the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone is this black stone, is about four feet, about four feet long and two and a half feet wide. The Rosetta Stone, you can actually go and see it. It's housed in the British Museum and it's treasured for the role it played in unlocking the mysteries of those hieroglyphics and revealing the secrets that have been hidden for centuries. Now this rock slab uncovered near this delta town of, of Rosetta, it bore ancient decrees in three different scripts, hieroglyphic, Egyptian, and Greek. Hieroglyphic, which could be described as these picture writings, Egyptian, and Greek. Now, of course, because scholars could translate the Greek text and they could translate the Egyptian text, 
Now, the hieroglyphics were not understandable. It took them several years, but they finally were able to discover the code to read hieroglyphics. And guess what? This Frenchman by the name of Jean-Francois Champ Champollion, he started the world by, dis by deciphering that hieroglyphics in the Rosetta Stone. Thus, the vast treasures of Egypt, those museums with all of those artifacts that nobody knew what they said, they are open for scholars of the world to understand. But most important, the long forgotten history of Egypt now told stories and gave evidence that confirmed scripture. It proved that what the scriptures were saying was true. Those stones cried out what the Bible had said was true. And these archaeologists, they continue to dig. They get more and more evidence. They continue to confirm Bible history by their discoveries. Recent discoveries at Tel Marduk have electrified the world of archaeology. This city was called Ebla back in Syria, and what was once was a very rich and sophisticated, very large society of almost 300,000 people. This discovery, by the way, is less than 50 years old. And not since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls have so many scholars in this field of study been so excited about what they've found. But it is even more exciting for students of the Bible. Because now, in this scribal school that's adjoining the city's palace, 14,000 inscribed clay tablets and fragments were found. And on these fragments, they dated back to 2,300 years before Christ. And the world's oldest, oldest government archive contains official records of the kingdom of Ebla, records for more than a, a century. Accurate records. And some historians question whether the Hebrews had actually developed an art of writing. Well, by the time of Moses and until the 19th century, no historical evidence had ever existed to verify that. But here at Ebla, tablets and other finds date way back beyond the lifetime of Moses. And in fact, archaeologists have discovered whole libraries that date back centuries before Moses. And guess what? In those tablets, many of them refer to a creation story. Many of them refer to the story of a flood. Many of them refer to stories of, of names and places which scoffers doubted existed but now coincide perfectly with biblical accounts. The names of Jacob and Esau and Israel and Sinai and Jerusalem show up in these documents. Well, the real surprise for many of them is the mention of the two sin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Archaeologists for years have scoffed at the fact that there was these cities known as sin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Guess what? On those tablets, there's references to the sin city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, before the discovery of these tablets, no historical reference was known to these cities except in the Bible. So now the Bible gets another stamp of affirmation. I say praise God. Amen. Some of these are just considered to be mythical places. The bottom line for scholars and archaeologists, Genesis is more than just an ancient shepherd. Songs and legends of ancient shepherds. The discovery at Ebla, without a shadow of doubt, confirmed the historicity of the Bible. Amen. So we can sit here tonight and say, you know what? I can trust what this, this book says. In the book of Psalms 119, King David said, the entirety of your word is truth. The entirety of the word is truth. Civilizations long dead are speaking from the dusty graves, from the archaeological shovels, confirming the accuracy and the reliability of God's word. I don't know about you, that thrills my heart. 
give you another, another example. Until the 19th century, some scholars believed that Queen Semiramis built Babylon. Well, wouldn't you know it? The Bible quotes Daniel. I mean, the Bible, the book of Daniel quotes Nebuchadnezzar as saying, this, is this not great Babylon that I have built? Guess what? 1899, Robert Coldway began excavating the old ruins of Babylon, unearthing tens of thousands of kiln-baked bricks, all bearing the stamp of King Nebuchadnezzar, all taken from the walls and the temples of that city. Once again, this is a turning point in looking at the Bible in such an authentic, not just a spiritual book, but actually a historical document. These cuneiform tablets that are so interesting, recounting Nebuchadnezzar's achievements, was also found by these archaeologists. On it, the king had printed the fortifications of es 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 I'm sorry, Esaglia and Babylon, I strengthened and established the name of my reign forever. This cuneiform tablet recounting Nebuchadnezzar's achievements was also found by archaeologists of Babylon. King had printed the fortifications of Esaglia. Here's the point. Book of Daniel. The Bible states that Nebuchadnezzar said, The king spoke, saying, Is this not the great Babylon I built for my royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? He spoke this. But for many, many years, historians didn't believe that Nebuchadnezzar was the one who oversaw the building of Babylon. And these ruins now thousands of years later are proving what the Bible says is true. Book of Isaiah. I did not speak in secret. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Amen. So God has pulled back the curtain of time for us through the, the gift of his prophetic word. And he did this to give us evidence to all that the Bible is not just any book. That is his book. Amen. If God can precisely foretell centuries in advance the future of kingdoms. He has the wisdom to predict the accuracy of what our future holds as well. Tomorrow night, we're going to go to part two of evidence of the authenticity of the word of God. We're going to look very closely at one of my favorite books in scripture that just nail it. As I said before, if I had one message to share this week, it would be from Daniel 2. Lord, we've looked at a lot of evidence tonight to kind of give us a picture of the reality that you don't want us to have any doubts in our minds, in our hearts about the authenticity and the believability of the Word of God. And discovering your heart, we've discovered tonight that you've given us all the evidence we need to base our trust that we can read the Word of, 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 of God as words coming from the divine, the divine Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know that there are times when our hearts are, we have questions, we have doubts, Lord, even your disciples went through that. Lord, I just pray that this new year we will make a commitment to get to know you better. To get to know you as our friend. To come to understand that you risked heaven and earth for our salvation. Lord, please, we don't ever want to take it for granted. So bless us now as we leave this beautiful little church. Thank you for the new friends we've made. Guide our footsteps and bring us back safely tomorrow. We love you, Lord, in your precious name. Amen.